Now we got some sound. Praise God. Well, it's a blessing. We have Sister Lisa Tesh and her husband, Brother Don. Isn't that your name, Brother? I'm just kidding. <laughs> I love Brother Don. He's, he's fun to pick with. So, but uh, we have them here with us. My wife, my father-in-law, my children, Ethan and Ariella. And, uh, and uh, of course, my lovely wife. Everybody knows Yana. If you don't know Yana, I'll send you the link to the video so you can see. So... Anyway, I have to have a little bit of a light heart to start with this morning because the message that you're going to hear today is not an easy message. And first I have to drink my coffee and it is camouflaged. Yes, praise the Lord. Yes, my wife said it in the background, it's Coke. <laughs> they make a Zevia though, you know, it's a Coke that's good for you. I'm not drinking it, but they make it, right? Okay. Anyway, if you have your Bible with you this morning or if you're watching live and you have your Bible with you, I apologize about the camera on the computer. I don't know what happened, uh, but uh, did not come through. I thank God for Brother Aaron, though, that he was able to direct me and find the part of the audio. And Brother Aaron said there's a way to increase this size where you guys can see the notes. So hopefully I'll be able to do that for you here in just a second. Uh, if you can, it's okay. I'm going to be going through everything with you anyway. Um, so you'll know what we're talking about in the first place. Uh, let me just see. I, I can't really see what to do there on that, but that's all right. Nonetheless, sorry. Right. If you have your Bible, I'd like for you to turn with me to 1 Peter uh, chapter 4, verse 17. And I actually have that in the notes there. It's the first scripture that there is. And... Uh, it's a, it's a scripture we're very familiar with, but it's not a scripture you don't you hear very often in in uh, in the Old Testament. It's just obvious that God always begins judgment in, in His own house, and it says here, First Peter four seventeen. For the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God, and at first begin at us. What shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? So, very serious um, scripture there, and I think a lot of times we take that lightly, we take it for granted. We're thinking when we think the judgment begins in the house of God, we think of the modern day church, and we think, okay, in our own church we must, you know, get everything right there. And, and yeah, that's true, we, we do, we, you know, that should be done, that's what he's implying. But in this case here, he's actually prophetically speaking of, of parts of the Bible Zephaniah, he's speaking of, uh, over in Leviticus, he's speaking of, and I've got one marked here, and I don't even remember what book it was in that I pulled that up out. Oh, Jeremiah. Uh, in Jeremiah, he's speaking of all these judgments that God has swore that he would do on his own house, the house of Israel, the house of Judah. The house of Israel collectively is one body of people. And this is a promise that he has made to them that when he's returning and he's ready to come back before he judges the nations, he's going to judge his own house first. And that's a scary thing. It, it's beginning when I read this scripture this morning. It's what really made me realize why there will be two thirds of the Jewish people in Israel that will be killed. Now I know why. And you're going to find out why. So like I said, it's a very difficult message. Uh, to even speak about because of my love for my own people, to know what's going to happen there. Uh, I think there is actually a city of refuge, though. You know, God's always had a city of refuge for the, for the children of Israel throughout the Bible. When judgment would come, there was a city of refuge. He literally names that city in Zephaniah. So, very interesting as well. Okay, before I begin with Zephaniah, which, which is where we'll be going next, I want to first take you to Zechariah 12, 7, because you really need to see this just as a stage setter um, so that you understand why you're going to see some of the things that are written. In Zechariah 12, 7, God says, uh, The Lord also shall save the tents of Judah first, that the glory of the house of David and the glory of the, how, uh, excuse me, of the inhabitants of Jerusalem do not magnify themselves against Judah. Now, the reason he brings back the house of Judah, because it was the house of Judah that was there during the time of the Messiah. It was a time when Yeshua came as Mashiach. Uh, it was the house of Judah that rejected him. It was... Uh, 
as Joseph put the cup in Benjamin's bag during the prophecy. Uh, I mean, a lot of people don't realize it was a prophecy, but when Joseph put his own cup in Benjamin's bag back the time during Genesis and probably chapter 43, 44, somewhere in that area, uh, he did that. But it was a sign that Judah, in this case, the, the, the house of Benjamin, because it was Benjamin's bag, would reject him at a future date. And it also reflects the fact that the Jews that are there today, because Benjamin was never guilty in the blood of Joseph, uh, per se, the blood because he was sold out and sent down into Egypt, he wasn't guilty. So the Jews today that say, well, we were not there, we had no part in it. He represents the Jews of today, but he also represents the Benjamites that cried out for his blood and said, let his blood be upon us and on our children. You know, literally, and we see that in the story of King David in the book of 2 Samuel, where he goes out and he's crying, there, you know, Shimei, uh, David is leaving the city. He goes, he weeps over Jerusalem on the Mount of Olives, and then he leaves, and Shemai meets him on that road, that's one of Saul's sons, cursing him, spitting on him and his men, throwing stones at them, and calls David a cursed man. Well, he was showing what is what Benjamin, the Benjamite tribe would do to Jesus when he came. And that's what they did with him. They spit on him, they smote him, they threw stones at him. And his men wanted to kill him, but David said, let him alone. The Lord told him to do it. So he said, even the fact what happened to Yeshua, it was a command of God for the house of Judah to do what they did. They were called. We are called chosen people for the purpose to offer sacrifices for sin. And Yeshua was the ultimate sacrifice. We had to do what we did. Unfortunately, we, he had to blind us because we would have never done it if we had our eyes opened. And so he blinds him. And so, of course, we see in the story with David when he comes back, but right when he crosses the River Jordan, which represents, you know, glory, because Elijah crosses the River Jordan, what happens? A chariot of fire comes down, picks him up, takes him into heaven. And uh, everything happens at, Jor at the River Jordan. Joshua, when Joshua meets, uh, Joshua comes down and Joshua is going to uh, cross the River Jordan when they're going to take the land. Jericho is going to be the first city that falls. And he has the Levite step in the water and the water parts, just like it did at the Red Sea. When Elijah came down to leave, the water parted, just like it, like it did with Joshua. Something about that River Jordan, you know. So anyway, Shimei, when they're coming back, he, then he recognizes that David truly was the anointed king. Same with the Jews today, the Benjamites of today, because Shimei, by the way, is a tribe of Benjamin. That's what tribe he belongs to. And we find in uh, uh, Zechariah 12, if you go down to verse 10, and you get a little further down, you read there, when you find the families that repent, because they've recognized the one that they have pierced or the one they have thrust through, uh, they recognize him to indeed to be the son, the son that was killed. That's in Zechariah 12, 10. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son and shall be in bitterness for him, as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. Then we find out, as you go down to verse 12, the families that are involved, and the land shall mourn every family apart, the family of the house of David. We find the family of the house of Nathan, the wives included in this, and the family of, uh, of, the, of the house of Levi, and the families of the house of Shemai. David and Nathan are from the, uh, the tribe of Judah. The Levites are naturally the Levites. And of course, Shemai is from the tribe of Benjamin. And those were the three tribes that were represented there when Yeshua came. It was only the house of Judah, those three tribes. So God, as he said in verse 12, he gathers them first because they were the ones that did the work. So the children have got to come back and repent for the sins of what happened with their fathers so to speak. And he actually says, so they don't boast themselves. So that Jerusalem, in this case, represents the house of Israel, does not boast themselves against them. So anyway, I uh, just wanted to set that stage so we know that who's there and why they are there. Why is the house of Judah there, not the house of Israel, which is also scattered, which also God has swore to bring them back as well. He promised to bring them back. So the scripture dovetails beautifully. So we get into Zephaniah chapter 1. I'm going to begin with verse 3. I will consume man and beast. I will consume the fowls of the heaven and the fishes of the sea and the stumbling blocks with the wicked, and I will cut off man from off the land, saith the Lord. 
And by the way, what's interesting, when he talks about the stumbling blocks, the two witnesses come to remove the stumbling blocks. This is why he's able to consume, because once the two witnesses come and they've preached their ministry, he's, the Bible says they remove the stumbling blocks. There is no more thing, nothing else for, the, for it to be stumbled at. So therefore now it's open and it's, you've made your choice and now God is going to bring judgment. Because when they reject the two witnesses, that's the final judgment because now the stumbling blocks have been removed. I will also stretch out mine hand upon Judah, see, and upon all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and will cut off the remnant of Baal. Now the inhabitants of Jerusalem, what are they doing? They're dividing the land right now. Jerusalem is the key. Well, we know that it's already it's been divided, but the thing is, is he's bringing out uh, uh, he's bringing out the, what's going what he's going to do. <clears throat> From this place, excuse me, I, I will cut off the remnant of Baal from this place. The, Baal has a remnant in Jerusalem. Oh. <laughs> well, well, what do you know? No wonder why at the Temple Institute, my wife asked, or no, we're listening, we're listening to the lecture. My father-in-law was there as well. And the spokesman there tells the people there in, in the lecture in the Temple Institute, Jerusalem is not under Jewish control. It's not under Israeli control. Why is it not under Israeli control? Interesting. <clears throat> so he says, I will cut off the remnant of Baal from the place in the name of the uh, Kichoims with the priest. See, what, what is, you know what kicharims are? That, that, is, uh, that, are, that is idolatrous priests. Priests that are idolatrous. Okay, with the priest. So when you think about that, there's only one other group that seemed to have priests in their religion, and that's the Catholic Church. And that's why those that have never, that have not been to Israel recently, I should say, um, we have just outside Joppa Gate, they built this beautiful outdoor mall. Incredibly nice place. And what did they do right in the very center of this mall? They adorned the mall with a nice, gigantic Catholic church. And they have uh, a statue depicting their opinion of Mary, which we know Mary was a godly woman. She birth our Lord and she cared for him, loved him, stayed with him until his death. She was so such a faithful woman, that's true. But God never intended for her to be worshipped. Never. See. So he's gonna cut off the idolatrous priest with the priest. That's the Israelite priests that have not obeyed God. And then them that worship the host of heaven upon the housetops, and them that worship, that swear by the Lord, and that swear by Malacham. Malach, a molech is it's called in Hebrew, molech. And I was reading this, and I'm sitting there thinking to myself, molech, who is molech to begin with? A lot of people don't know who Molech was. Molech was a god that, that, uh, that, that it, wasn't, it wasn't an Israeli god. I, I can't remember if it was from Ammon, but it was a god used back in northern, it was in Egypt in, in northern Africa. Now, keep in mind when I tell you what they did with this god here, that you would bring your newborn child and lay it on the statue's arm. You would sacrifice your firstborn and so that you would have prosperity and God would have mercy upon you, or their God, not the God of Israel. That's one reason why we don't like using the name God in he, uh, as far as amongst the Jewish people. But now for the Jewish people that listen, a lot of times you use Elohim, but Elohim also is for both ways too. So we can't, we can't be so critical in that regard. If you say Elohim, it could apply to the self-existing one, but God also uses the word Elohim to apply for the false gods as well. So it's really no different in that there. That's why God has a divine name, and his divine name doesn't belong to anyone but him. But Molech, they would take and they would bring their children, and Israel became guilty in this. 
they were doing the same. Now, here's what really you can tell offended God so much because what happened? What did the, what were the Egyptians doing when they went into the, back during the times uh, when Moses was first born? They went there to kill all the firstborn of Israel. They were sacrificing to the God of Molech. That's what the Egyptians were doing. And now God says here, he's so angry. This is when God is rising up for judgment. And he says what? Peter says it here. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And so before God even deals with the nations, he deals with his own people first. It says, and them that worship the host of heaven upon the housetops, and them that worship and swear by the Lord, and that swear by uh, Molech, or Malcolm, I think is in King James. Now, <laughs> it shows, and the word Lord, by the way, there is God's divine name. Yod Heh Vav Heh, Hashem is the way the Jews we say it. Uh, some people say Yahweh, different versions there, but we know that. We don't, we don't know his name yet. Moses said, they will ask me your name. They never asked him his name, so therefore he told them his, their name, so they didn't know it at one point in time. But undoubtedly, it's an unfulfilled prophecy because the children of Israel never do we have a recorded history where they ever asked. So they've got to ask, and it's going to be in this day when he returns with Elijah, that they will want to know the name of God. That's how they're going to know that, one, he truly is who he says he is. He'll know that name. God is going to supernaturally, according, even Zephaniah's prophecy, it's in the third chapter, he said, I will restore a pure language unto the people. So we know it's going to happen. All right, now, <clears throat> um, I wrote some notes here there, and I just want to make sure I didn't forget any of the, get of the oh, wow, yes, I'm glad I did not forget that. Okay. Now, modern days, when I was reading this, this is what came to my heart. I was blown away by the revelations that I had received this morning. And Sister Lisa, she had prayed over and asked a special blessing today, so thank God for that. And um, I'd wrote in here in my Bible, did Israel forget that it was Pharaoh that killed the firstborn, and yet today babies are sacrificed or they say they're blessed when they take their babies up to the Catholic Church and they lay it in the hands of the priest and he sprinkles water on the baby's forehead that if you ever seen it by the way in every Vatican they have the horns for the for the bull there is where they put the the bread at what they call the pass uh, the the Passover bread uh, you know the kosher bread which they do it in the round circle as a form of the sun to show that the sun and of course the horns represent uh, the female organ and it's showing the fertility. That's the god of Molech. And the god of Molech is actually a bull with the horns with his hands out like this here. And so when they take and they come up in ancient times, they'd place the baby in that god's hands. Now here's what's important. He's called Molech. Molech is from a, from a Hebraic word which is for king. So they have crowned him king. And what did Israel do recently? They took and they put a seat at King David's tomb for the Pope of Rome. And the Bible says clearly here, you're, you, you take and you worship and that swear by the Lord He's talking about Israel. You're swearing by the you swear by Hashem Himself, and that swear by Molech. Just like Shimon Perez. What does Shimon Perez do? He's handed all the babies of Israel over to the Vatican and said he's the only one that can bring peace, and yet he claims to believe in the God of Israel. And so, what are they doing? Just like the Catholic people and 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 and. You know, I, I can understand if you're in a church and you go and you ask somebody just, you know, Jesus said, suffer not the children, little children to come to me. Don't, don't stop them from coming. Let them come. And he would bless them. He laid hands on them. He didn't sprinkle water on them. I mean, that, and they call that a baptism. That's funny. No, they're, they're, they're cleaning their sacrifice to offer it unto their God. That's what they're doing. And that's why the priest holds his hands out just like that 
Molech God statue and they put that baby in its hands and everything and you're offering your firstborn into the Vatican. In fact, actually, if you know anything about Catholicism, and I know there's brothers and sisters that listen to this video that were deep into Catholicism that can tell you these things to be true, but once you bless that child like that, that child now belongs to the church. You have give him over to the church. So, and I saw that and I'm like, this is unbelievable. So then I decided, okay, let's, let's just see what else is written in the Word of God about this. And um, now speaking, let me just say this real quick before I go any further here. God is coming to do the judgment. And I'm going to go back to the judgment in a moment here. Um, when you go into Jeremiah... Jeremiah chapter 32. Uh, I'm sorry, let me take you to Leviticus first. I think it's more important to go to Leviticus first. Leviticus chapter 20, verse 3. And I will set my face against that man. I'm sorry, verse 2. Again, thou shalt say to the children of Israel, Whosoever he be of the children of Israel or of the strangers that sojourn in Israel. So keep in mind, when you become a believer in Yeshua, that is a believer in Jesus, you are that stranger. A stranger is of the nations, in other words. It's normally the way it's translated. It's actually in Hebrew. It's normally as nations. You become part of the family and the body of Israel. It, he's not just saying that, in other words, you live in, in America or Australia or New Zealand or one of these countries here or, or Europe or whatever. If, if, you, if you do, uh, or, or the strangers that sojourn, that sojourn in Israel, you are in Israel. You have become the spiritual Israel, not doing away with Israel, but have become part of the same body, partaking of the same olive tree from the same root, which is Christ. And now that's how your branches grow is in this, in this manner. Now, he says here, that giveth any of his seed, which is his children, unto Molech, which is the God, he shall surely be put to death. The people of the land shall stone him with stones. So any man that dare take his child and put it into the hands of that statue that would allow his child to be placed there should be stoned and killed. That's his word that he says that. It's not mine. It's, only, it's God's word. Now, watch what he says about it. I will set my face against that man and will cut him off from among his people because he had given of his seed unto Molech to defile my sanctuary and to profane my holy name. Keep the next temple they're wanting to build in mind when you're thinking of this. Because remember, my wife asked that guy out there that did the, uh, the, at the Temple Institute, she said, are you going to build the temple of Ezekiel's prophecy? He says, no. She said, well, then when will this one be destroyed? He says, it won't be destroyed. She says, well, then how is Ezekiel's temple going to be built? And he had no answer. Ezekiel's temple is not a temple that comes down out of heaven like we see in Revelation either. It's a temple that's going to be built here. So they're, they're planning to build a temple, but they even themselves say it's not Ezekiel's temple. What kind of temple is that then? There's a lot of people not going to like me after this, but you know the thing is, if you're building a temple to Molech, then you've got a problem. And God is saying that's what you're doing. Now, not the people here, not the people who are listening, but I, well, there's some that might. So what does he say here? I will set my face against that man and will cut him off from among his people because he hath given of his seed unto Molech. That man. There was a man in Israel that just gave over the seed of Israel unto Molech. When he went and handed the children of Israel over unto the Vatican, which by the way, those that may not know who the Vatican really is, you have to remember Hadad. Hadad was one of Esau's descendants. He was of the seed of Esau. When David was killing all of Esau's descendants or all of his children off during the battle that they fought, he killed the Bible says he killed every male child, every male that was there, 
The next verse says, but one child, one young child, and his servants, which were all Edomites, Esau's children, escaped and went to where? To Pharaoh. He was reared in Pharaoh's house, under Pharaoh's gods, under the god of Molech. He asked Pharaoh if he could leave. Pharaoh says, I have given you everything. It's an antitype, is what we would call today. Moses was reared in Pharaoh's house as well. But the difference between Moses and Hadad, Moses leaves and becomes Israel. He becomes part of his people. He became into the ditch. He, he made the bricks, uh, you know, he, he became poor like his own people. Not Hadad. Hadad came out just like they do today in the modern system of what they call Christianity. It's not Christianity. I don't say there's not good people in there that, because we know God says, you know, come out of her, my people. So there are good people there. And my heart's desire is to see as many people to be saved as possible. So they have to come out. If God says, come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins and of her plagues, then she's going to have, she's full of sin and she's going to be plagued as well. All right. But then he takes Hadad. He becomes the king of Syria. And Rashi records that he moved to Rome. Why? It was important for the Jews to track the descendants of Abraham because we're brothers. God says when they came and they destroyed Israel in 70 AD, he challenges them. He says, why did you stand in the crossroad of your brother, Jacob? Well, Jacob's brother is Esau. He said, you come and you cut it off and you destroyed the I'm just paraphrasing it, but you destroyed the temple and you burned Jerusalem and you were as one with them. Who's the them? Well, a lot of scholars try to say that Babylonia or the Roman Empire had two legs, Eastern and Western. And they say the Eastern ones were the ones that were doing the fighting. But God said you were one with them. And Titus, the Roman general, he wasn't from the Eastern leg. He was from the Western leg. He was from Rome, Italy. And, he, and when they did, got through killing everybody there and taking the treasures, the spoils, what did they do? They took it back to Rome, where it sits in the catacombs of the Vatican until this day. So imagine that one. So, um, but anyway, so Hadad, we have the record that he goes into Rome, and so we have literally the descendants of Esau are there. That's why when God says, I have hated Esau and I have loved Jacob in the Bible before he was even born. And a lot of people think, gosh, God is a cruel God. The kid isn't even born and he hates him. He was talking about what he represented, what his children would represent. And it's interesting because you look at Esau and Jacob. When Jacob deceived his brother, Esau gave up his birthright. That's also another way where you know why Molech, the God, comes from as well because that's what you do. You give up your firstborn. Esau was the firstborn and he gave up his birthright to serve other gods. Not Jacob. Anyway, so going back to Leviticus here, it says, And I will set uh, my face against that man and will cut him off from among his people because he hath given of his seed unto Molech to def here's a click clencher to defile my sanctuary and to profane my holy name. How does it defile God's sanctuary just because somebody give away their child to another God? It's a prophetic scripture. What does Daniel say? The abomination that maketh desolate, they shall come in and defile the sanctuary, they're going to build another temple. But if they're not waiting on God to build Ezekiel's temple, God will build Ezekiel's temple when he wipes off what they've messed up here. And God says, you're, you're defiling my sanctuary and to profane my holy name. Why? Why does he say my holy name? Remember what he did over here. They call upon the name of the Lord, which is yod heh vav -Heh, and the land, and, and, and they call upon, uh, uh, excuse me, let me get right back where it's at now. And to them that worship and that swear by the Lord and that swear by Molech. So these people here, they're both uh, 
glorifying the Vatican, because that's where the God of Moloch is now, and you can see it in everything they're doing, and they're also glorifying the God of heaven, the true God, the God of Israel, but yet you're not to do that. And then we see clearly in Leviticus, it's got to be for a future time, because it says, He hath given of his seed unto Molech to defile my sanctuary and to profane my holy name. Because why? They were using God's name involved with this building of this temple that's not of God. Leviticus 20 verse 4, if, And if the people of the land do any ways hide their eyes from the man when he giveth of his seed unto the Molech, and kill him not, then I will set my face against that man and against his family, and I will cut him off, and all that go a whoring after him to commit whoredom with Molech from among their people. There's going to be a lot of people in Israel that will end up thinking this is a great thing. We see it already. Now, there's a lot of rabbis already in Israel that are totally against the Vatican or anything to do with that, but unfortunately there are some that are not. We see rabbis that go to, to Rome and say that we shouldn't, uh, uh, I think one rabbi, he was a leading rabbi in Israel, and he says, you know, we shouldn't uh, cut off the hand that's got a hand out to us to help us. Because see, it seems like a good thing. That's the, that's the hard part. It seems to be good. But they don't serve the God of Israel. Now, from there, now I want to take you to Jeremiah's prophecy. In Jeremiah chapter 32, We'll begin with verse 29. And the Chaldeans that fight against this city shall come and set fire on this city and burn it. With the houses upon whose roofs they have offered incense unto Baal and poured out drink offerings unto the go other gods and to provoke me to anger. For the children of Israel and the children of Judah have only done evil before me from their youth. For the children of Israel have only provoked me to anger with the work of their hands, saith the Lord. Now you're going to find what's really interesting. God, in this part of Jeremiah, He's going to show you the past. He's going to show you what happened. And, I mean, way out past. He'll bring you up to the time of Israel in 70 A.D. And then He'll show you the future. And this is what we're looking at now, way back. This is when 700 years before Yeshua even comes. He's angry with both of them, but he's really more angry with the house of Israel because he, he sends the house of Israel into captivity. And by the way, it was under the hand of Syria. Remember, Hadad was the king of Syria and his descendants. So Esau, that's why we always see Esau always hates his brother Jacob. Everywhere you go, Israel's had to deal with Esau, the remnants of Esau, everywhere. It's kind of interesting. Okay, verse uh, 20, And the children of Israel and the children of Judah have only done evil. Okay, we read that. Sorry, verse 20, uh, excuse me, 31. I'm, I can't see well here. It was Jeremiah 32, 31. For this city hath been to me as a provocation of mine anger, of my fury, from the day that they built it, even unto this day that I should remove it from before my face. Hmm. Because of all the evil of the children of Israel and of the children of Judah, which they have done to provoke me to anger, they, their kings, their princes, their priests, and their prophets, and the men of Judah, and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And they have turned me the back and not the face. Though I taught them, rising up early and teaching them, yet they have not hearkened to receive instruction. But they set their abominations in the house which is called by my name to defile it. Again, we're seeing something built that's not of God. That's verse 34, 35. They built the high places of Baal, which are in the valley of the son of Hammon, to cause their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire unto Molech. Again, we can see who's involved in all this. Which I commanded them not. Neither came it into my mind that they should do this abomination to cause Judah to sin. Remember Zechariah 12? Who's going to be the one that go, returns home first? 
Judah. Who's the one that gets caught? This is, this is not the house of Israel now. This is Judah. They're causing Judah to sin. See, it looks good. See, because the Vatican is going to make it look good to them. You know, we're, we're here to build your temple. We're here to, you know, to, to make things better for you. That's not what they're there for. Yeah, they've got to see. And I think I, I, I would not be a bit surprised if they don't bring out the ancient menorah from the, uh, the second temple period. To, 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 to try to create a false revival amongst Israel. Because I, you can't blame the Jews. If they see the ancient menorah, it would send a revival through Israel. It'd be hard for the true remnant of the Jews to recognize this is not of God. But we have a commandment. And I think this is why the two witnesses will have to come on the scene to protest that this is not of God. Now, uh, it's covered up on my screen, so I have to go here at verse, 32, uh, verse 36. Excuse me. And now, therefore, thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning this city, wherever you say, it shall be delivered into the hand of the king of Babylon, and by the sword, and by the famine, and by the pestilence. Now, this is dealing with the time where Israel goes into Babylon because of Jeremiah's prophecy. Behold, I will gather them out of the countries, whether I have driven them out in mine anger. And then he goes back into the restoration again. And that's where he says, and they shall be my people, in verse 38, and I will be their God. And I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever for the, Lord, for the good of them and their children after them. See, then he brings it up further into the future. So even though Jeremiah was preaching this back then and it, children of Israel did go into Babylon, we still don't see that part about them bringing in the God of Molech into the temple. And I'm sure anciently they did, but they're doing it today. Now, back to Zephaniah again. And I'll just skim through this here and we'll close. And them that are turned back from the Lord, verse 6, those that have not sought the Lord nor inquired for Him, hold thy peace at the presence of the Lord God. For the day of the Lord is at hand. For the Lord hath prepared a sacrifice. He hath bid His guest. And it shall come to pass in the day of the Lord's sacrifice that I will punish the princes and the king's children. And all such are clothed with strange apparel. Notice the king's children. It's a future generation. Children, just like the daughter of Zion or the daughter of Babylon, those are future generations. He's talking about the future generation. In the same day also will I punish all those that leap on the threshold which fill their master's houses with violence and deceit. And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord, that there shall be uh, the noise of a cry from the fish gate and a howl from the second and a great crashing from the hills. How you inhabitants of uh, Mictesh, for all the merchant people are cut down and all they that bear silver are cut off. And it shall come to pass at that time that I will search Jerusalem with candles and punish the men that are settled on their, uh, excuse me, settled on their lees. They say in their heart, the Lord will not do good, neither will he do evil. Therefore their goods shall become a booty and their houses a desolation. They shall also build houses but not inhabit them, and they shall plant vineyards but not drink the wine thereof. The great day of the Lord is near. It is near and hasteth greatly. Even the voice of the day of the Lord, the, the mighty man shall cry there bitterly. That day is with wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of darkness and gloominess, and a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of the trumpet, alarm against the fenced cities and against the high towers. See, he, he's dealing with Israel first. Then when you get into Zephaniah, you go into chapter 2, and you get into chapter 3, then he starts dealing with everyone else. Gather yourselves together, yea, gather, gather, O nation, not desired, before the decree bring forth. The day pass, pass as the chaff, before the fierce anger of the Lord come upon you. Before the day of the Lord's anger come upon you. He's telling them what to do before this happens. Seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth, which have wrought his judgment. Not just the Jews, everybody. Seek righteousness, seek, seek meekness. It may be you shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. The only time he's going to hide anybody is when he comes down and brings that anger. 
For Gaza shall be forsaken and Ashkelon a desolation. They shall drive out Ash, Ashdod. At the noonday, and Ekron shall be rooted up. Woe unto the inhabitants of the seacoast, the nation of the Cherethites. The word of the Lord is against you. O Cana, the land of the Philistines, I even destroy thee, that there shall be no inhabitant. And the seacoast shall be dwellings and cottages for shepherds and folds for flocks, and the coast shall be for the remnant of the house of Judah. They shall feed thereupon in the houses of Ashkelon. Shall they lie down in the evening? For the Lord their God shall visit them and turn away their captivity. Right when all this is coming down. Isn't it interesting? He even names the city that he's going to come to and turn away the captivity of Israel or the house of Judah in this case. Anyway, God bless you. It's pleasure for those of you that are listening live and those that are catch us on YouTube later. Uh, we thank God for you for listening, being a part of today's service. And let me just say in closing to those that are listening live, you know these things are happening. I mean, we see, those of us even present here, you can turn on the news and see these prophetic words taking place. Just not all the time do we really understand what it means. I mean, and for, and for me, just something struck my heart this morning as I was reading it, and I'm like, I've got to find out what this is about. And so I just began to do the research, and once I saw the research, then all the other pieces that God has given me in the time past started coming together. Then I knew who the God of Molech was. I knew where the, where the history of this all come from. And then I saw these other scriptures, you know, talking about defiling his whole holy sanctuary, being an abomination, and handing the seed of Israel over into the hand of Molech. And yet at the same time, you're calling on God's divine name. That tells me that they're going to, maybe they'll even have a form of what they believe to be his true divine name. And they'll call upon his divine name, what they think is right. And at the same time, exalt Molech to be the great God as well, that has helped restore the temple maybe is the way they'll look at it. Can you see why God has to destroy two-thirds of the inhabitants of Israel? Judgment begins at the house of God. And he says, if you don't do it, he said to him, if you don't do it, I will, put, I will come against that man and his house. And Israel didn't put away sin. So therefore, judgment comes now. Anyway, let's check our own lives up because in our own lives, we want our own hearts right before God. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you, dear God. And I just ask, Lord, that it's a very difficult thing to listen to, Lord. We realize the only true safe place is in Christ. It's in Christ. Yeshua, the Messiah, in Him is the only safe place to be. Help us, Lord, to rightly divide. Give us a spirit, dear God, your spirit, Lord, the Holy Spirit, to direct our paths, Lord. And then help us, Lord, with caution to go before others and tell them of the hope of glory that the Lord is coming soon and He's coming, Lord. You're coming, Father, at a time, Lord, where it's not going to be very pretty. You said that the mighty will tremble in fear because of Your presence. And then You warned even Israel, make ready for that day. And now we see the makings of it. Soon they will announce the building of a third temple. And as much as Israel will rejoice in the building of this third temple, it's not Ezekiel's temple. So what, what happened?